I called an order for the uh, special meeting and the enterprise committee meeting of a whole for February 7th, 2014. Uh, Madam Clerk, take a roll call. Yes, sir. Mr. Birch. Ms. Dombowski. Present. Mr. Quinn asked to be excused because of his conflict of interest, which the chair granted. Yes. Ms. Gray Jackson. Honored to be here. Mr. Honeman. Ms. Johnston. Here. Mr. Starr. Here. Mr. Steele. Here. Mr. Traney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'm here too. Oh, Probably. did I miss you? No. I'm easy to miss. You're really at the top of the agenda, and no. I, I missed that. <laughs> I believe, I believe Mr. Birch might be okay. on the phone. Chris, are you on the phone? Legislation to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have anybody on the phone? Not. Uh, my uh, first order of business for this is, Mr. Wheeler, I'd like for you to just kind of lay out, uh, I, I guess my term would be some ground rules for us here. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Senate members, you should have, in addition to the agenda itself, two handouts. Um, one is in bold at the top, Special Assembly Meeting, three award for project management contract. Uh, if you could refer to that one, what we tried to do is outline for you in that document what is and is not fair game for discussion in a public session. Um, the most important breakdown is uh, under the top part, appropriate topics for public discussion. And on the back of the second page, inappropriate topics for public discussion. And those are generally confined to things that are particular to the proposals themselves, including, including the proposal submittals, the evaluation, the score sheets, etc. But outside of that, you'll, you'll note between page one and the back of page two, there's quite a list of things that you can get into, including the nature and scope of services. You know, the RFP itself, of course, was a very much publicly available document in terms of what we were looking for. The procurement process. Thank you. Is that you, Mr. Birch? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is it, uh, Number two, the procurement process, which the purchasing officer will get into, and that's this cool be addressed primarily through the second document, which is a timeline and some particulars on the procurement process. In number three, we have a representative, I believe, here from CH2M Hill. Is that correct? Uh, let's see. We don't see them. Okay. They were supposed to be They're supposed to be here. Maybe they'll get here a little bit late. But um, if you wanted to um, address CH2M Hill or have them respond to certain particular questions about their experience, um, and then, of course, their relationship to be the litigation in detail. We can have a discussion about that as well. Um, if we get into those particulars, I'll probably turn it over to Mr. Owens to speak about what we've done to arrange a firewall between CH2 and Mill as VECO versus CH2 and Mill as the proposed project manager of the fourth project. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we can uh, proceed into the particulars on the process itself of the procurement you'd like. Mr. Starr, you had a question. Yeah, are we typically allowed to see the actual contract that we're voting on? Uh, the code requires, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hadden, the code requires us to give you the material terms. So more often than not, what we do is we give you an AM that spells out the particular terms. Jim, Ms. Johnston? Could we have um, the materials that you presented us and we've gotten from purchasing? Is there any chance of having those emailed to Mr. Birch? Sure, we could do that. Yes, um, when Mr. Had it starts his part, I'll step out and, and uh, give direction to get these emails to Mr. Birch. Right. Well, the reason I bring it up was because we got an email from you, which was placard confidential, which talked about the possibility of addending the contract specific to this vendor. Do you remember that? I don't remember the email speaking specifically to it. You handed it to me at the last meeting with the green cover sheet. Okay, I'll have to. What is it that you want me to do? Sorry. You're. And I, we can talk about it at debate, but your point was talking about there's possibilities should we choose this vendor that the contract would be amended to include specific clauses. Okay. I want to know how we talk about that today. All right, I'll have to uh, look at 
that email. I don't remember the particular contents of it off the top of my head. Sorry. Thank you. That's all right. Ms. Johnson. And you just... You're good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bikalos, I understand you're going to open. Well, I was, but then I just took the winds out of my sail, covered everything <laughs> I was going to cover. I feel so disappointed, but you don't, I know. Uh, but with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ron and go over the process one more time. Ron, can I just ask Mr. Okay. Uh, if I could uh, direct your attention to the document that's entitled RFP 2013 uh, that I had just handed out. I don't intend to read this entire document to you because uh, the facts on here speak pretty much to themselves. Uh, but I will hit the highlights uh, on this and then please interrupt me if you have any questions. This was a full and open competition and by that I mean it was advertised on the municipal website for those vendors that uh, vendors or contractors that had a desire to respond to it, which is the typical way in which we will advertise full and open competition requirements. They we're not going to let individual vendors know about them uh, unless we have a very narrow view, a very narrow field of vendors. So this was advertised on the municipal website as a full and open competition. Um, the scope of work and the RFP document itself were de developed over a period of time with the assistance of outside counsel and the department is how we uh, developed the requirement. We actually did uh, receive a total of five, five offers. There were three addendums issued uh, as a result of questions from those offerers. Mm -hmm. We did conduct uh, the initial evaluation and the decision was made to shortlist the three firms. Those three firms were subsequently interviewed by the evaluation committee with the end result of our uh, intent to award being released to all proposals on January 2nd, which follows the typical process of which we use. And then just as a highlight of what uh, we can release at this time, I can't tell you the, the vendors because the code prohibits me uh, from listing names and tab tabulations until after uh, the assembly has approved the contract. However, those Proposers that competed on it uh, had the ability to review the winning proposal. Uh, the two short, two of the firms that were shortlisted did take that opportunity, did review the proposal, uh, the winning proposal, one of which uh, subsequently asked for a debrief from the purchasing offices, which was provided. And then after that debrief, they subsequently came in and wanted to review the winning proposal proposal again. Uh, I can tell you that in general terms, uh, it wasn't that close. Uh, the winning proposer was uh, significantly uh, received more points technically, and they were the lowest cost evaluated price. Uh, I know there has been some discussion about how can you allow a firm that is uh, in lawsuit with the municipality to propose or bid. Uh, there is no code provision uh, that prohibits a firm from proposing or being awarded to the contract simply because we have pending litigation with that firm. <clears throat> there were seven individuals on the evaluation committee. Not all of those were from the municipality. Some of those were from our stakeholders at the board. I listed the scoring criteria that was in the RFP. Uh, I'm not going to go over that because you can read that, read that yourselves. Uh, there is a potential uh, litigation that's uh, under consideration. Uh, however, that litigation was for work performed by VECO, not CH Toon Hill. CH Toon Hill assumed the liability when they bought with VECO, but the work itself was performed by VECO Corporation, not by CH Toon Hill. And none of the person, personnel that were involved in the VECO work will be involved in this particular project that uh, we have. Uh, subsequently, at the request of the Assembly, the bidding, board, bidding Review Board did meet. The bidding Review Board has access to the full procurement record. They reviewed that full, pro full procurement record. In addition, there were two letters submitted, uh, one by 
P and D, one by Arcadis that the bidding review board did in fact have, and they did review those letters. The result of the bidding review board was they recommend award of the contract to CH2 and Hill. Uh, they did change something. They did recommend that the options be, appro be approved by future assembly uh, action and not approved as part of the basic award. Yes, sir. I'm getting in the queue, Ron. And then the, uh, as a result of the bidding review board, they uh, also ruled that they found no apparent material conflict of interest for CH of the proposal. That's the real quick overview of the solicitation and the actions. Uh, the evaluation of the bidding review board is consistent, just for refreshing, consists of nine, mem nine members from uh, various aspects of the community representing the professional services community, the construction uh, industry, different boards uh, from AWU, and also a member at large. So it's a pretty good cross-section of the bidding review board. Very good. Okay, so that's a real quick summary. I'm assuming you folks will have uh, directed questions. I'm more than happy to answer them as best I can. Ms. Johnston. What's the timeline as far as this bid being challenged? We passed that it because you said that one of the uh, um, companies has asked for a second and review. They did. They have already performed a second review. Uh, and then I have subsequently met with that company after, after the bidding review board. Uh, I have no inklings that uh, there will be a, uh, an appeal. The code does not give a timeline. It doesn't give a timeline. When the company can appeal. And, and I guess this would be to our attorney. We were, we followed an unusual practice by sending it to the Bidding Review Commission board um, without having another company challenge the bid. And so if there was a challenge, where would it be? What would, I mean, would it go back to the Bidding Review Commission uh, Board? It's a good question um, to the Chair. Typically, you'd expect them to ask for the review prior to your award. Once you've made the award, if they chose to take action then, I would suspect that they would not go back to the Bidding Review Board. Um, but maybe they didn't have to take that in the Supreme Court to challenge your decision. The bidding review board has already met. Right. Uh, it's just we, we did an unusual process yes. here, so I just wanted right. to know what what the upshot of that is. So it would go to the courts. I think so, and if it went back to the bidding review board, if that were, were the course, then that would be pretty straightforward. It wouldn't take a long to go through that process. Okay, thank you. Mr. Starr? Mr. Wheeler, first, did you have a chance to refresh your memory on? I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it to be sent back to my phone so I can review it. Okay, well, I'll hold that question later, but it does reference the contract specific. Will, when will the contract be available? I'd like to see it. Not just the condensed terms, but I'd like to see the actual contract. I have that available. Is it now. finished? It is complete. It is waiting on assembly approval. I cannot, or Mr. Bacalis, we cannot sign that contract until the assembly has has approved it, but we do have a signed copy from it in existence. Okay. I can get that to you very Yeah, soon. I mean, we're going to approve it. It'd be helpful to see it, especially given the fact that I believe that Mr. Wheeler's weighed in on a few um, specific changes to that, and so I'm going to hold that line of questioning until then. I don't believe there were substantial changes, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I don't believe there were substantial <coughs> changes from the contract that was part of the actual solicitation itself. Well, that's my point. That concerned me that we would change the actual terms of the contract to clarify the, the difference between, say, a VECO and a CH2M Hill or the relationship in there. And that, that seemed to be what Mr. Wheeler was referring to when he sent me the memo, but I don't want to get too far into that. If we have got to go into executive session, we'll do it later to talk about it. Um, that said, <coughs> did the Bidding Review Board talk about perhaps um, inside 
inside not in a derogatory or improper way, but did, did CH2ML have access to data and records and, and port information that could have allowed them to bid differently because they had the knowledge that they inherited from BCO? No, sir, I don't believe they get all information that CH2 and Hill, well, from VCO, I don't believe so, but all the information that CH2 and Hill created as a result of their contract with the Corps of Engineers was made available on the website for all vendors. To everybody, then all the engineering yes, data, all the support document stuff. Yes, sir. Um, and again, Mr. Wheeler, well, you have a litigation going on here. How about some of the data that's been specifically tendered as part of the court proceedings, had, did, did you have a request to tender that data to other bidders? No, sir, I did not. Do you know I'm if that sure occurred, Mr. Wheeler? Uh, through the chair, I'll let Mr. Owens speak to that, but I believe Mr. Adams' answer is correct. But I don't, but, you know, the, the, the actual process of collecting and gathering and cataloging all that material is so ongoing. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the information that CH2 and Hill prepared was related to the condition of the structure, the design and the construction, and then possible design concepts going forward, those two reports. And the material relating to that work was all available on the website. So everybody else then as well. The earlier comment about the personnel will be different than, than the VECO folks, I'm already challenged by that because that hasn't occurred that way for me. I've already been approached by the previous city manager who's intimately knowledgeable about the project, probably was even let on the original contract into the, to the baggage administration discussions. So how can we, you know, not, I don't know that inherently that's a problem for me that, that you bring that. That could also be a benefit that historical knowledge come forward. So I don't want to say that, but you, you referred, inferred that, you know, it would be a totally new group of people working is what you'd said at this work session earlier. and so. I, I, I guess that hasn't been practiced yet so far. I mean, I think we were all solicited by um, basically Dennis LeBlanc, uh, who works for VECO, who, who was a city manager here as well. And I saw him at the last assembly meeting. So what, when you say that it will be a new work team, can you elaborate what they promised us? Through the chair, my understanding is when we are talking about the actual technical people that will be working on our project, as the project, as our, as our PMB, those are the people I'm referring to when I say those people that are working on our project will be people that have not been, that were not part of ECO and were not part of the, the VECO study that was done. Yeah, I mean, if there's local talent available, I wouldn't want to exclude anybody from it. So is that a contract term? Personnel yes. Yes, key personnel are a contract term. Is the Hoover by name? Yes. In certain of our contracts, we have the contractors submit who their key personnel are so we don't have a bait and switch going on. And so what we've done in this contract is we have asked them to list key personnel to where they can't switch them in and out. It's typical in a lot of, as I think. Well, professional contracts it is, and that's kind of why I would like to see it, as well as the clause that if that person leaves, what happens? When a person leaves, then they have to submit someone of equal ability for us to approve or disapprove. And if we don't approve it, then the contract's null and void? No, then they would probably propose someone else until we reach an agreeable that this person is equivalent qualifications of the individual being replaced. That's all for now. Mr. Train, you mentioned when you were talking to us that uh, because we're in litigation with VECO, there's no prohibition against us, or cease to help. There's no prohibition against us from Give the contract to them. That's correct, sir. There's no code How often have we given the contract to a firm that we're in litigation with? And any other ones you know about? I'm not aware of uh, others I would have to refer to. Through the chair, Mr. Training, we see this a lot, particularly with um, some of our larger construction and road projects. We have been in litigation with Shannon and Wilson, and yet we still contract with Shannon and Wilson. We've been in litigation with the Boutte Company, and yet we still do work with Boutte Company. The same is true for Perus Construction and others. So I don't have a list year by so year, but it's very, very common. So we do have a record of giving contracts, even though we're litigating. Absolutely. And it's usually um, when you can divide, you know, you have a project here and a project there. There's, there's no intertie. There's no access to evidence that's pertinent. Um, this one's a little bit closer, but the way we manage that was by creating an agreement 
with CH2 inhale that they've described in terms of the firewall and separation, and so there's no bleed over. If there's, if there's any problems, if those get resolved through that side agreement. Thank you, Dennis. Mr. Trombley? Going back to what you said, uh, we, we regularly do business with people that are currently in lawsuit. Well, not regularly, but, but it has happened in the past. Yes. This, is it fair to say that this is a building road? I mean, this is this is a big project. There's, there's a big mistake made. This is a lot of money. Well, is there is there a scale that you guys look at? No, sir. It's just a really a, a, a legal precept. Is there a bar or isn't there? It doesn't matter the size of the project in terms of the dollar amount or the physical size. Is there a is there a common sense aspect to it? The common sense. I'm in, I'm in a lawsuit with Cruise Construction over. $100,000 because there's a pothole and there shouldn't be one, as opposed to $100 million. What, through the Chairman's trying what you're looking for is whether there's a, a direct and irreconcilable conflict, <coughs> and it's our determination that that does not exist here. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to reemphasize the point that you made because I want to hear it again. Okay, and I've heard it before, but I want to hear it again in this meeting. And that point is that the potential litigation is uh, was accomplished by VECO and not CH2M Hill. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Dembowski. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Haddon, after the bidding review board came back with their um, recommendation for the uh, future options to be approved by future assemblies, was that incorporated into the contract? The exercise of an option is by mutual agreement anyway. So, we would not. I'm just asking my so very there's, late there work. So, there's work. nothing you had to do in order to? That's correct. Okay. And then, um, now Dennis might tell me I can't ask this question. Um, but if we do not approve the current um, option before us of uh, giving the award to CH2 and Hill, what type of liability are we opening ourselves up for, especially since the bidding review board sort of come back and said that everything is above board and they're the winner of this? To the chair, Mr. Timboski, there's a, there's a number of practical considerations that I would let um, Mr. Michaelis and perhaps the court speak to. In terms of the legal side, uh, it would be no secret that um, the most likely outcome is that we would be facing a claim from CH2 and Hill for their prep costs. And, um, it isn't, it isn't spelled out directly exactly how you get to that um, analysis, exactly what would be allowed in cost or not. But um, it's, it's very common that if there's a situation where a winning proposer feels like they have been arbitrarily excluded from the award that they can submit the cost. Any idea how much that would be? I have no idea how much they would submit the cost. Can I follow up on that, Mr. Chairman? Um, and then, so from a practical standpoint, if we were to turn it down, then bidder number two would be the next one proposed? How chair, does it work? Ms. Domboski, um, the way it works is that no, you would not default to the second proposal and you would start the process over. And that's where we get into the practical considerations because that would build in some delay and would have an impact on the court project schedule. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stark. Even if we didn't let the contract at all to anybody, you're saying we would face um, prep charges from CH2 Hill because they went through the energy of providing a bid? Yes, sir. Are you sure? I'm not, I'm not saying that they would prevail, but, but I think they would have um, a certainly culpable claim that we would have to defend against. Because Just because we issued an RFP and they had to prepare for it, is what you're saying? Right. And while we have some re reserve language that re reserves to us the right to not make an award, um, um, it's always better in my mind to have on the record reasons that you can support and justify. Sure. Thanks for following up. I'll be back with you and Mr. Steele. Yeah, on that topic, uh, I'm sure there's subject to language in the, in the contract, subject to approval, um, or I would expect it to be. Now, if they relied upon statements by you to do additional work, it might be something. But if they're, if they're subject to, don't they have to rely on that in terms of? Through the Chair, Mr. Steele, what we're talking about was whether or not they would be entitled to the cost of preparing the proposal. They certainly wouldn't have a right to the contract itself. 
there's no guarantee that they would get the benefit of the contract, but there, are, there is case law regarding the process and whether it needs a cost back for engaging in the process. I'd like to answer your question. Sorry, yes, there is language subject to approval. Yeah, and I, I would think that that's what any any bid, in, you know, has in it that you're you're taking a risk when you put a, put a bid in as to whether or not you're going to either get it or get your money back. But I, what we're talking about is the potential for defending a lawsuit because, and I, and I will use some inflammatory words, that the assembly made an arbitrary and capricious decision not to award a contract. But that's, uh, I say the potential exists, not saying that they would exercise yeah, it. but they explain that. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Sarkin. If you had a chance to review that. Yeah. Because the, the, the word just came up here under a side agreement, which the contract is going to be sort of tailored to address specific challenges or concerns that you see as it relates to, to that. Can we talk about that? The, assembly, the yes. assembly's all seen it. Yes, we can. We can talk about it. Um, there's, in your, if you just refer to it, Dennis, specifically the green paper right there. Yeah, I had it right here. Oh, can I have mine back then? Yes. Because <laughs> the, the, the points down there where you talk about the the five things you list that the contract would be modified for. So, you know, like number one, which says you, you'd modify the contract uh, based on the award in language that say no contract, or the management contract has no bearing whatsoever on the claims or defenses of CH2M Hill. And, and will not enter this contract into evidence anywhere else. I mean, the, the work overlaps, and so how can you say that, that the engineering data or even ongoing engineering data that, that concludes couldn't just be part of the record at, at the court level? Through the chair, Mr. Starr, um, what this describes is the arrangement for the firewall, and that conversation occurred with um, Council for CH Hill and Mr. Owens. The, the idea there is to make sure that there isn't this bleed over. And we want to know what does that mean as a practical matter to address it as well, Mr. Owens. But, uh, but don't package the question so much that way as, as a negative. It, it, they, they would have an unjust right at the court level. I wouldn't want a restriction from the historical perspective of what happens to affect their ability if they get the contract to manage it successfully in reverse of that, what you say. I mean, the firewall can't be both ways. The firewall doesn't prevent the use of the data generated by the depot work. Sure. That, that's all essentially public data now. So it's not that they can't use that data, but I would say that that data has been largely superseded by all the additional work, all the additional drilling and boring. And there's a lot more data out there beyond just the deco data in terms mm -hmm. of what the global stability looks like. And, and so all the that other data is usable. And, and all the other bidders got to see that too. That is what you're also saying. Yeah. That's, so it's actually public knowledge, anyhow, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the nature of the side agreement is that an addendum to the contract? I was actually out of the room just for a minute, but is it part of the specific contract? No. The, fundamentally, the, the um, RFP included a draft proposed contract, and every bidder was given an opportunity to propose changes to the agreement if they chose. I see. Um, CH2 and Hill did propose a couple of changes. Those boiled down to ultimately um, a change that affected the required provisions for the uh, professional liability and automobile insurance. Just basically what's available on the market. Um, so the, the language was cleaned up a little bit in that respect. It also modified the indemnity language in a way that made it sort of mutual, but gave us superior rates. So it's only in those two areas of the contract terms that were modified. There is a separate understanding between the council on how the litigation would be managed. And the provisions that you're looking at that refer to how this, whether this new contract can be introduced as evidence, what kind of training might be <coughs> provided to their employees to, pre to prevent unintended disclosures of information, how unintended disclosures of information would be handled if any occur, and um, those sorts of things are all an understanding between trial counsel. So it's that the litigation involves Vico's work of examining 
the global stability of the open cell sheet pile design. It's the litigation. Okay, I, I got gotcha. you. So, so it's kind of a discrete topic of what, whether the design, Deco evaluated the design of the open cell sheet pile that was the former or was installed before. Going forward, the open cell sheet pile is not going to be used. So the litigation is really over past history. Going forward, the work is going to involve a design that is not refined yet. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we're pretty certain it's not going to be open cell sheet pile. So the work going forward that FICO will, I mean, that CH2 and Hill will be performing is, is we anticipate will be discrete from any issues that are involved in the litigation. And there'll be separate offices, separate people. There shouldn't be. And when you say that, I get I get a little queasy because I don't know how you can potentially do that, especially given the vehicle titles of the same people that are. I mean, it's it's an office over here, so I, I mean, I, I guess I'd qualify that that's uh, a detriment when, or a when liability. When I say that, I'm referring to people who were employed by Vico when that work was done in 2005-ish, sure. 2006. Well, but then are now currently employed by CH2 M Hill and will likely consult on this. So that's what I was getting. I'm not trying to beat that one no, up to no, death, but I don't want to inadvertently exclude talent base that may have the historical knowledge on why we're going to work with sheet pile, because this this is what happened, and it could very well be that that's a vehicle employee now now put by CH2 M Hill as a good idea. Uh, I, that's it's just it's just a little frustrating to have to blend that into that, and it does appear that the contract is. I, I'd have to read it, but it doesn't appear the contract's been specifically modified that you wouldn't put in those generic statements for any bidder. Uh, is that true, or are you seeing clause language that's specific, especially the firewall language, which we've yet to see? But yeah. That's not part of the professional manager's contract itself at all. There's no changes in the form contract that is left to all bidders to address that concern. It's a separate um, understanding between trial counsel. Independent of what we're approving Tuesday night? Yes. It applies only to VICO, and uh, it's, so it's only applicable in the event that you approve this contract in a separate contract. Why is it an attached to the contract? It's not a term of the contract. It will be to the chair. It would have to be if it's predicated on approval. It will be. A, it's a separate but yet still fully enforceable agreement once and if you approve the main professional management contract. And we won't be able to see that side agreement either. I mean, I don't know that it matters that I do see it, but you can. Yeah, just to the chair, Mr. Starr, I think one way to think about this is when we create the firewall, we're more worried about things bleeding into the litigation that shouldn't be there that prejudice our case, sure. and less about the resources that CH2 Hill brings to the project. So I imagine a scenario if there if there are people who have worked with Vico that have a skill set that CH2 Hill wants to bring to the project, we can have that conversation with them. So I wouldn't necessarily think that this would foreclose somebody's talent and skill coming to play in the project versus having some information prejudice our position in litigation. But that's and I, you know, I, I'm trying to not prejudice the conversation in my mind with, are we choosing the right vendor to do the right thing? And yet we've spent, you know, 35 minutes in time talking about how potential litigation, current litigation affects that. So who's here to talk about what the first couple of steps will be to revisit the, the design work and are we, I mean, I'm still caught up, do we even need to employ this group right now? Do we need other internal conversations about what we're going to build? Everything I see in this sheet talks about north construction, north birth, north this, north that. And I mean, my challenge right now is how are we taking care of our current customers, Tote and Horizon and all that? They've already dealt with this crappy construction time frame and now we're going to continue to focus on the north and these guys, five years from now, maybe they'll see an improvement? Uh, that's, uh, if I may, to the chair, uh, that, that's not necessarily true, sir. Uh, so in the proposal, uh, it was very clear. It, it certainly highlighted three options that were made available to us that we thought were possible good solutions. 
But it also asks them to look at a, uh, a fourth one. And the fourth one is also uh, a very likely uh, good solution. And what we've asked this team to do is to look at those three solutions, but to ho focus in on the fourth one. What the fourth one does, it actually causes less movement uh, and less um, hardship on the current carriers. It defocuses on the north end at all, other than no matter what option we do, we do know that we have to degrade what is currently established in the north end. In other words, we have to cut back and at an angle, no matter what we do. And we have to do that because of the siltation issue. But what's good about the last two options, uh, that the two that we really like, that could be feasible, and specifically the latest one that we added, is that it allows for us to go out to 40 feet, 45 feet. So in other words, we're moving out so that we're at a 45 foot level. That accomplishes several things. One is it puts us within the requirements placed on us by Department of Defense. And then number two... You're talking deep water. Deep pilot, water, yes. It's not the pilot. You're That's talking. right, deep water. It moves us out mm -hmm. so that we're, you know, at a depth of 45 feet without having to dredge all of that if you're closer into the shoreline. Mm -hmm. So it moves it out. The other thing it does, it gets you into a little bit of swifter water that helps the scouring effect. In other words, helps the uh, desiltation to move back or back through faster instead of coming back inside. So it accomplishes those two things. We really are hopeful that uh, this last option that we're uh, concentrating on is the one that we can make work. And we do need these folks to do that. The other thing we need these folks to do is to design the cutback for the north end. No matter what we do, we've got to cut it back. We've got to cut it back to some degree. We've got to pull out what's up there. And then, uh, I ask you, the, the consultation and all that, the engineering support and sort of your action plan, was that prescribed to you by CH2ML? Um, you know, and, and I'll throw a compliment out there first. The last thing I remember was we had probably one of the best work sessions that I'd ever gone to with the open and transparency about the sheet pile, the damage, the pictures. Right. That was uh, probably, what, a year and a half ago now? CH2ML did that. So your action way forward plan now, is that based on what they're telling you? It, it's, it's based on not only that, but it's also based on confirmation by the third party engineering firm, uh, national firm that we had to come in and reevaluate that whole work that was mm -hmm. done, and they confirmed the findings. Uh, the other thing is, it uh, does not focus on putting another dock to the north end. It really focuses See, on... See, that's what I'm challenged by, because it says it right here, George, uh, on your AIM, no, no, it says but, that North Perth construction. But, but in, the, in the RFP, it very clearly indicates, and in the contractual language, it, it indicates that they're to look at that. And the other point I need to make is that they're also required... Okay, just a minute. Okay. Because it, it says it right in our AIM, George, it says phase one is construction of a new berth at the north end. So okay, I, I want to be careful... To, to the chair. We, we wanted to establish where we left off. No, I want to know the scope of management of the work, and if they're going to focus on North Perth construction, then we have to back the bus up a little no, bit. No, the, the AM's clear on this, the RFP's clear on this, and the contract's clear on this. These are, these are uh, alternatives that were developed and considered, and they're still valid, although they have cost and other challenges. We, we're starting from this place with the best information available, but we have been very clear, and this AM speaks to it, the challenge with funding and the need to look at all other alternatives and, and possibly improvements on these already developed. That is something we want the PMC to evaluate. Sure, but restate the RFP then because my, and I'm respectfully asking to do, or the AM rather, because it's phase one, you got removal of the bulkhead, uh, the stabilizing the bank, sure that's your number one, and then the next three points of what I see as a couple years worth of work are construction of the berth on the north end, rail spur to service the north berth, and then all the drainage, utilities, lighting, communication, all the paving at the north end. That's a heavy emphasis on the north end for years and years. We haven't decided that yet. The, the, through the chair, the mm -hmm. point this being is, is it's, th these, these are key elements to, uh, to consider with whichever phasing plan we ultimately decide on. It looks on. like this is the one we're approving. No, the, we just want to establish where we stopped with the concept development where the last schedule and cost estimate stopped. 
those are key points in um, forecasting, you know, putting a magnitude on the project. And so these are still elements to go, come or go out of the project depending on the, the business case, the, the phasing constraints, uh, the needs of our customers. Okay, so well maybe I'm not stating it clearly because it looks like a phase and action plan and discussion. It, it, it the was options, only. I don't mind the options. He talked four of them. Right. I see two. If we, we haven't had a chance to develop further options. That's the first one of the very key first steps under this PMC agreement that we're we're recommending approval on. And the contract addresses that, as does the RFP. I haven't seen the contract. <coughs> I can't see the RFP. So, and then, okay. I, I mean, this is why I say this is what we see. Action item on Tuesday night. This is attached to it. This is what the record comes. Okay. This is hopeful. This meeting, but it's raising questions for me on that north emphasis. Yep. And then back to the conversation, George, that you didn't answer was what about Tote Horizon, those other user groups, maybe even some of the cruise ships. Those are the those, those are the things that I was going to address uh, until we. Sure. You know, well, because it was one point at a time, and, and right. you're going to restate your overall reaching goal. So, so also, uh, they are required in the contract, uh, and also in the RFP, to get with the user groups, and when they evaluate these other alternatives, uh, and also take a look at what was already proposed, they have to get with the user groups, and basically get all of their input, especially on this last one that we think might be a very good one, a very good alternative. Because what it does do, it allows them to stay where they are. They don't have to move to the north end. It also allows, uh, through a series of shifting back and forth, uh, and, you know, back and forth to accommodate the construction, it allows the dock to go out. The other point that I wanted to make is that in this contract, it's something that needs to be started right away in order to have uh, some modicum of success of getting this done in a timely manner is we have to go back through and redo all of the environmental uh, work because our permit is expired so we have to go back through and so they're going to be required to do that so there's an awful lot on the plate for these folks to do and this you know from my perspective the sooner that we get in there and do it then we can take care of some of the siltation problem that we're dealing with today right today we're dealing with it uh, and it's an inconvenience to Tote and others. Uh, but the bottom line is, the sooner we can get in there and, and uh, get the engineering work done, we can also solve that problem. Yeah. So, I didn't hear a motion to approve, but I, I'll just put it on the record. Right now, I'm opposed to the long-term nature of that contract. Most of what I've heard and described to us is sort of still conceptually, con conceptually designing an action plan, what you just described, redoing the, the uh, uh, environmental permitting the discussion, choosing which phase is it come north or whatever. Personally, I don't think we need to engage in, in a potential nine-year contract with a customer or a contractor until we have that. Customer negotiations is our job, yours in particular. So I, I'm, I'm not sold on the approval of the contract or the need of it yet. So that's all I have. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wheeler, did you have a comment from you? Mr. Steele. Yeah, <clears throat> it, it kind of raised some questions in my mind. Uh, the thing I wanted, I need some, uh, I guess, some uh, some words that help me uh, feel better about uh, us us hiring uh, CH2M Hill and the VECO issue is still outstanding. Are they going to have access to uh, any <coughs> potential information or potential proprietary information that uh, that would help them in their suit against us or hurt us in their suit in the lawsuit um, by virtue of the contract. Are they going to? To the chair, Mr. Steele, Mr. Owens. Uh, we've taken what we believe are reasonable steps to prevent that. The, uh, in the course of this uh, litigation, of course, there's a lot of information that gets exchanged as part of discovery. That's going to happen. What they have agreed is that if there's any information that they obtain that they wouldn't have otherwise normally obtained through discovery, then they will voluntarily return it to us and they won't use it. And they'll train their people to be on the lookout for it. So while it's, uh, it's unlikely, it's either kind of 
Yes. And we can't rule out the possibility of information inadvertently getting to them. We believe that we're operating in good faith and that there would be every effort taken to keep things according to the normal rules of civil procedure and restrict the case to that. And so we are expecting that there won't be any information that shouldn't be. If um, you know, if they're if they're the contractor that's going to go out and say uh, this needs to be done, this doesn't need to be done, in terms of how far back they go, how much sheet pile they have to replace, and so on and so forth, uh, that could limit their liability in terms of the eco uh, suit if uh, if we went along with it. I suspect. Well, recall too that they are not taking the role of designer. Okay. They are helping us pick designers. They are helping us choose the professionals that will do the design and make the recommendations for construction. So in that sense, they're not the ones that will be making those calls. They'll just be helping us with our own staff evaluate what are the best alternatives. Thank you. Mr. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, <clears throat> your, your notes here say that none of the VCO personnel will be involved on this project, correct? So I guess that means that they're still there, but they won't be involved on this project. That's correct. That's okay. my understanding. And so is there a requirement in the contract that former VCO employees are not to be involved in this project? How are you addressing that in the contract? No, that's the that language is not in the contract. We can amend the contract to put that language in, but again, that would not take care of Mr. Starr's concern about whether we uh, have the talent that's, that's needed. Well, if, his concern is one thing, but what I'm talking about right now mm -hmm. is you made it clear that VCO personnel are not going to be involved in this contract, in this work, except it's not even in the contract yet. So I think you really need to put that in the contract, and you need to um, figure out how this is going to be follow through. Really, that's really important to me. So, anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harmon? Okay, so I did the math on this, and it's six million a year to have this contract, and I'm now hearing, and I think I got it clear, that they're not really mm -hmm. going to be managing the contract, managing the project of the actual, whatever concept is chosen. Is that correct? <coughs> They, they are going to be managed. What they're going to do is they're going to assist us. They're going to assist us in all these different ways that I mentioned, and not the least of which is uh, uh, selecting um, the engineering firm to basically do the design work and also the construction firm. Now, whether the method of delivery has not been determined yet, whether it's a design bid build, a design build, or it's a GCCM, that has not been determined. Uh, uh, determined yet because that will be determined based on recommendations from the project management team uh, as well as assisting us in getting the environmental documentation done. Um, so the bottom line is they are our representative and they're our representative to help oversee the things I just mentioned but the most important thing is the design effort by someone else and the construction effort by someone else. So to follow up briefly, I noticed that the uh, funding source is the general obligation bond from the 2013 election to state, 12. And I'm not sure if this is a new question or not, but how much money is available <coughs> off of that general obligation bond? Well, there's a whole bunch of, is it just, are you just talking about the obligation Well, this, the bond? funding source shows that the 30 million comes from the 2013 state geo bond. Mm -hmm. That was a 50 million. It's 50 million. So there's 20 million left. We're going to spend more than half on a now for six man, I think I'm, I'm sharing where Mr. Starr is going. We're going to eat up a lot of our funding, of potential funding, um, with how many people doing what. If we don't have a design, if we don't have a concept, we're not moving forward. And I, I'm afraid we're going to burn up a lot on the front end, and then we're going to be challenged. We're always going to have the challenge of how much money and funding we're going to get. You see where I'm? May I comment? Yeah. Through the chair. I think one of the things that we, we've lost track of is the type of contract that this is. This is, and I'll use it a couple of terms, it's an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, or maybe it's a master services agreement. We are not obligated 
a dime of the award of this contract. What we will, when we will actually be obligating money is when we issue specific and discrete task orders of the type of work that we want the contractor to perform. What we're asking for approval for is up to $30 million over five years, not a full $30 million right now, because each task order will determine the exact work that they're doing and the money. So I, I get that. So let's just say up front we have a very slow process. We're looking for new permitting or we're doing some scope in the north end, and that's two million out of the thirty million possible. So you mean to tell me there's then going to be twenty eight million left? Yes. That, that, so if I, at the end of five years, if they've done nothing more than two million worth of work, we're not obligated to pay them the thirty million. That's correct. They only get paid for the task orders, specific task orders we give them. And that has to be done satisfactorily. To follow up on Mr. Starr's concept, <clears throat> what are our resources currently available to us to begin the whole EIS process? And, um, and what would be our resources to immediately, as soon as possible, fix the eddy caused by the North End construction? Do we have resources available to us at this point to do this work without a project manager. And if we do, who would the project manager be? Well, okay, so this is a two-part question, and I think I had part of it. Ron may have the other part. If you're asking me, do we have in-house uh, personnel, uh, basically, to do the work itself as far as the permitting? Probably not. If you're asking me, do we have personnel that could help oversee uh, someone doing the permitting work, permitting only, probably. But the bottom line is, we're still going to have to go out to have a contractor do the work, because we don't have the personnel, the tech, uh, technical expertise to actually do the work on the permitting. That's why you hire that type of service. Um, but if you have your project management team and you get them on board early, that would be part of that task. Uh, and they'd only get paid for that task when it's successfully completed. So again, you're not, what you're committing to is the possibility of spending $30 million in that five-year period of time. What they have provided us is uh, costs. They've given us cost factors for different type of things. And we negotiate that cost. This is the rate. This is the labor rate. This is the type of rate that you could expect to pay for this type of service. And then when we issue the task order, then we negotiate the price for that particular task. And that's, and that's what we agree to finally when it's negotiated, and that's the work that's expected to be done. So the second part of that question was, if we do not hire, hire a project management team, and if we piecemealed until we got to a point where we have a design bid or whatever type of port, who would then be the project manager for that within the municipality? We, I, I, I would strongly recommend that we would hire that out because what you're looking for is not an individual. You're looking for a team. And you're looking for a team that has all these various disciplines that's going to be required to oversee uh, the successful completion of this project on our behalf. Now that does not mean that we're not involved in that. But so, so if we went ahead with permitting without a project management team, would our engineer from the port be the project manager as far as getting the necessary paperwork, the necessary applications for those permits? He would, I, I suspect what would happen is we would contract for someone to do that work he would oversee that effort. But you used a word that was very, very good. And the word you used was piecemeal. That's the word you used. And the problem is, when you start doing that, that's exactly what you've got. But I'm, I'm just, when I'm trying to narrow you down, George, would you as municipal manager, would you be the project manager if we didn't hire one? Would you be overseeing the project as, as municipal manager if we tried to do as much of this as possible in-house before we went and bid it out, again, did another RFP with a different scope. 
I guess what I would tell you is, regardless of the method that we choose, will I be involved? I'll be involved until I leave here. Yes, you betcha. As involved as I am today? Yes. So you can't leave? No, well. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm just. <laughs> you kind of answer my question, you kind of have it. Um, and and um, again, and just, just for the benefit of the rest of the assembly members, um, I periodically do meet with our major customers in the port. And um, I met with uh, Mr. Lowry of Coke yesterday. And we, I think you remember a couple years ago, we had a, a problem where the tote vessel had to not finish unloading and go back out and come back in. We are there again. Um, they tried this year with the court to scour it, to dredge it to 45 feet, and with the, hot, with the warm weather that we had, it sloughed. And we are in a very precarious place. And I just want all of you to have that information to know, no matter what we decide, what we do, we cannot continue to have this issue because we are challenging one of our major customers with excessive expenses that were by our cause. Well, could I just clarify? Uh, if you're asking, uh, you asked if I would be the project manager. I'm just saying, who do we, you know. So, okay, so on our typical yeah. project, if we have a small project, we do have some project managers. And that project manager could actually be the project manager directly on that site, okay, and work. More typically, we hire that out, and the in-house project manager is the go-between between that project manager that oversees all the construction effort and contractors and everybody else, and he's the one that makes sure all the paperwork is filled out, et cetera, et cetera. And so he is our go-between to that project manager. So we do it both ways. Small projects, we have the capability to do it in-house. Large projects where there's multiple disciplines, we hire it out. Mr. Dembowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through the Chair, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Haddon, I just want to follow up on Ms. Gray Jackson's comment. When we were talking in the beginning, you clearly said that you have a list of eco employees that won't be allowed to work on this project moving forward. Can you say that? No, we okay. have a list of CH2 on Hill key personnel that will be involved uh, moving forward. Okay, okay, okay. And we know none of them were involved as VECO. I was equating the two as basically as VECO. You know, these are the approved people, so by default, these other people won't be allowed to work on it. Is that a mischaracterization? Or? Through the chair, through the chair uh, Mr. Bossi, my anticipation, anticipation is when we finalize this, what we'll have is an arrangement that there's no VECO employees, former employees, working on this project without the pre approval of the municipality so that we can get the skill set if it's needed, but we make sure that there's no bleed over that affects our position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's why I wanted to clarify because what I heard you say earlier was kind of the opposite of what I thought I heard you say. So I want to make it clear that as we move forward, we're not going to have the same crew. Without the municipality's express permission, we're not going to have the same crew that was involved in the veto issue involved in CH2 that will help moving forward, correct? That's a correct statement. Okay. And I just want to understand the, the premise of this contract. I mean, obviously, we need a plan forward. We're not there yet. So we're talking about phase one, phase two, phase, you know, option three, four, 25, whatever it is. The big part of this is the fact that we need some sort of project manager that will help us solidify what design we're going to use moving forward. Correct? Correct. Okay. So if we don't have a project manager to help us with that, kind of screwed, right? In my opinion. Okay. You don't have to answer that. That was, that was a comment. So um, that being the case, and the other thing I just want to follow up on Mr. Honeman's comment. You know, we're approving an up to 30 million, right? As we go through with the permitting, that'll take out some money. As we go through the design, the, it, all these different factors, we will incrementally get up there. Um, so those are all portion, those are all pieces. But like you said, if something goes awry and we decide we're not going to utilize the 30 million, then we'll know that too. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trombley. 
Uh, following up, Mr. Steelhead, I thought you made some really good points there. As far as the, the lawsuit goes, we're approving a contract with CSGM Hill, we're in a lawsuit, but they're going to have intimate knowledge of the current project. And Mr. Owens, you said that we're making the assumption that everybody's going to be acting in good faith, um, that we're not going to open up ourselves to any additional liability. If they have unique knowledge of, of the project, my guess is they'd have unique knowledge of what happened in the past. How can we be assured, without making the assumption, how can we be assured that we're not giving them some sort of competitive advantage against us in the courtroom? Through the chair, Mr. Crowley. Um, <coughs> what happens in, in litigation is there's a you have the discovery rule where you turn over what you have, right? It's yeah. very broad, and um, they can see a lot of information. That doesn't mean that it's actually admissible in court. So if there were some disagreement about what could and couldn't be used, we'll see that well before it actually is presented to a jury or to a judge in the courtroom. So we'll have the opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute, under our agreement, that can't be presented. And if we can't resolve that with opposing counsel, we'd let the judge resolve it. Mr. Stark? Why does the contract have to be five years long for the first phase? Why are we locking them up as the, as the choice? Again, we, we base the schedule and the cost estimates on where we left off with the most recent work we did. We believe that this project is at least that magnitude and at least that time to get it done. From a five-year period includes two years of concept design permitting and putting all of the uh, contractual arrangements in place with either a designer and or builder in whatever combination makes the most sense. That's going to take at least two years. It's, it's going to take at least another three to build that project. So we want this project manager to take this project from cradle to grave as our agent through the entire process, advising us on the key decisions to be made. That's what the five-year period covers, the first phase. We believe the project, whether it goes north, goes south, stays in the middle, is at least two primary construction phases. That takes you into the next four-year period. It does, and it's same inheritance of sort of the reference with the labor contracts, it also takes it way past another mayor or another leadership change. So if, if I read it right, we got a five-year plus two more years of two, uh, or, or a total of nine. If that was flipped, if I if I had the comfort that, that after two years this body comes together and evaluates along with the recommendations, I would feel much better that the first portion of the early stuff on was was two years. Five years is just, you know, yeah, it sounds great, but if, if the track record on this project has has moved forward, it, it isn't working out all that well. So my my reservation is that is that concept. And again back to the emphasis, and I appreciate Ms. Johnson reference in our current customers and the challenges that they have. Can't get their ships in, can't do whatever. I mean, I, we promised them an overhead crane, rail mount cranes, things that we ordered and didn't buy. We, we jerked them around. Who knows if they didn't expand their ship sizes or their whatever based on that. Again, until I feel comfortable that we're able to manage what we have already under commitment, these current customers, I see north this, north that, $6 million a year in the areas that potentially don't give us back what we need in the immediacy. That's that's my reservation for for it. So your answer about cradle to grave, I get all that, but but once we do it, we're locked, whether it's CH Tomb Hill or whoever. And and an exit clause after two is the only way I see to back the bus up if it goes south again. And I've I've lived through this. I've been here for seven years now. It's not been fun for me. Well the chair. No, I'm not here to debate you. No, I, I just want to clarify a few things because I think I can speak to a Well, it sounds like my with. argument now. No, I don't no. want to go there. No, so I'm, I'm not, telling you. I don't want to argue. Why I just want to state Let me ask you a question then. Why didn't you do a two-year and then add the subsequent after that? Because we're committed to a successful project, and we believe that a successful project that meets all of our needs, both of the port and the municipality and of our stakeholders, is more than just um, shaving off the corner on the north end. We have a we have a, a serious structural deficiency with our existing terminals. We we are suffering from severe corrosion. <laughs> Something significant has to happen there, and this project frees us up to do the do the job right. And um, all the concept development work that's always been our objective. So uh, we 
we can use this PMC contract as a vehicle to do less than that. There's no guarantee of expenditure. We don't have to spend one dollar towards the 30 million. We are constrained by the funding we have. We can do um, the minimum that we can do with that funding and probably make some positive, positive a contribution down there. But it won't solve all of the problems, the, the very important problems that need to be solved. Well, and, and where I see what happens the way government runs is we hire them and they turn around and hire HDR, HDL, ICRC on down the road and then you know it's the next guy's problem because this guy said well HD is it HDL or HDR that's being consulted here with these groups they want to hire them right out of the gate ICRC again you know we, we get into these situations that that perhaps give us no opportunity from this body to say wait a minute that's not working out real well the only choice then is litigation I, I'm not I don't want to go down that again and the way it's structured right now with that five-year here you go I, 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 I'll tell you that, that to me, whatever comfort you just said to me isn't. It's, it's like, wait a minute, we can't, we can't stop it uh, for fear of, of, hey, we got a deal. You know, and, and then it becomes, is, is their subcontractor doing a good job? Well, I can't prove that. You know, and different city manager may be here. It's, 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 a, it's too long. That's all I'll leave you with. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. One of my biggest concerns was, um, given a contract to a company that we are and that we're suing, okay, if you will. And to me that's like rewarding a contractor for bad behavior. So that's been my biggest concern. And the good news for me is once again it's been stated that none of the personnel involved with ECO um, will be working on this project because the potential litigation is against VECO employees. Okay. And then my question was was if there's some provision in the contract that would prevent this. You said no. And the conversation went on a little bit further after you said no, okay? And I was under the impression that you're going to fix the language in the contract so that it's clearly stated that none of the employees um, who work for Vico will be working on this project, except Mr. Wheeler said that um, that's possible, but you have to have expressed approval from the MOA. And to me, that's a problem. You know, I don't want to see any of um, the uh, Vico employees working on this project, not now, not ever. And that's the kind of language that I would like to see in, in, in the contract, that they're not going to be working on this project. Um, and I want to know how that's going to be um, put into this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank chair, you, Mr. Chairman. Through the Chair, Mr. Craig Jackson. As I said, my proposal would be to include it in the, not in the main contract, but the firewall. And I'm not comfortable with excluding everybody just because they work for VECO. I think the goal is to exclude those people that would have the kind of uh, information or knowledge that might lead to a prejudice of our case. So if it's, I mean, just to give a, a hypothetical that seems to make sense to me, is if you had a, an assistant or <coughs> support staff that really had nothing to do with a particular issue that's taken VECO, but they work for VECO, why couldn't they work? In that project. So that's why I want a gatekeeping function where we say, yeah, that was fine, no big deal. They didn't have anything really particular to do with the, the hardcore substantial facts in the VECO case, but they worked for VECO. So it should be okay for them to work for this particular project. That's, but we need to we have, we have to judge, make that call on a case by case basis or person by person basis. Can I follow up, Mr. Chairman? So, in other words, if somebody does payroll and we're actually out there about the project, that's the exclusion you're talking about? That would be one example. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank you, Dennis. Mr. Steele. Yeah, I, I guess um, I, I certainly understand uh, Mr. Starr's point of view in terms of not wanting to lock himself, lock ourselves in for uh, the five-year period. But uh, uh, I suspect that that was, uh, you know, a, a part of of the, uh, the RFP in terms of uh, what you were going to do and how you were going to do it. Uh, we've got to do something. Uh, we've got to be moving. We don't have the money to do all the construction and, and stuff we want to do anyway, so it's going to be piecemeal uh, to a certain extent. Uh, <coughs> but we need somebody on board that's going to work for us and, uh, and do a good job. Hopefully there's an escape clause if we don't like what's going on or how they're doing it. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, 
uh, we, we know we need to do the evaluation, the planning, and the permitting, and uh, we need to get ready to do some construction. And, uh, and I'm, I'm frustrated that we don't have, that something's not going on now. Uh, Ms. Johnson's point about the, uh, about the customers, uh, they're caught in the middle of this whole thing. And, uh, you know, we are going to have to do some dredging, I suspect, or, or something so that that pier face is deep enough that they're not going to have to shift ship in the middle of, a, of unloading or loading. And, uh, and so uh, I want to get on with it. And uh, I think that ch know has a good reputation. I understand the concerns uh, about, about the lawsuit, and I still have those concerns as well. But hopefully all of everybody else does too. And we'll try to keep that uh, straight. But uh, we need to get on with stuff. And, and barring anything else that I see that I don't particularly like, uh, I guess I'm prepared to move on. Ms. Johnson. Um, actually, um, Mr. Starr makes a, a very good point. It's one I've been trying to figure out in my own head how we would address it. And um, I would even be interested in postponing this two weeks to address. And what what I would want from the administration, and this is just I'm speaking to me personally, but I think the assembly needs a means to audit, for lack of a better word, the project as it's going forward. We need to, we, we've all have been at that, that end of a rope that none of us feel good about. So we need to have some means in which the assembly is engaged also in the overseeing. I know we have a strong mayor's um, charter, but I think the assembly needs to have, you need to come up to the assembly and provide us with a communication plan and it has to be very timely. It has to be done. You know, I hate to have meetings for the sake of having meetings, but we might have to have it um, meetings that happen on a bi-monthly basis, or you know, it's, it's going to be high frequencies in the beginning and then maybe through the whole process. I think you're going to. I would want you to come up with some form, and I'm not sure if if this is. Funding for the assembly office, a, a small percentage out of the contract where we can, out of maybe out of the design work, maybe a uh, maybe a percent of the design work would go to the assembly office, so we could have our own third-party review team. And I know this is complicating it. I know this is making our our municipal manager's stomach just go into a huge knot, but. <laughs> you know, for the politics of this, we need assurance for not just the 11 of us sitting on the body today, but there's a number, uh, you know, some of us will not be here as this goes into full construction, and it, it's needed for the new <coughs> assembly members also. So, so I want to have a communication plan as part of the aim that's brought to us as far as the RFP. And if anybody disagrees, you know, chime in. I would like to have some form for an independent assembly audit, engineering, and, and I would, my suggestion would be that that would come out of, it'd be a percentage of the design money um, for, so the assembly would have the opportunity to hire a third party review so that we're comfortable with whatever is decided. And actually, those are my two main ones. Anybody can add to that? Mr. Honeman? Yeah, and, and I, I'm thankful, Ms. Johnson. I was, that's where my next comment was at. I just, just before you made the comment, I was adding to those would bring great, great comfort, and I, I will echo Mr. Starr if we're going down the list. I, I would like to see potentially a re rewrite of uh, not necessarily the agreement, the terms, of whatever, but the term of the contract, length of the contract. Three years with two optional three year contracts, you get to the same nine. Why? I mean, I find it ironic that we're talking about a five-year contract when so much was made with that five-year contract. So I'll leave it at that. Mr. Gray Jackson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Ms. Johnson. I really appreciate your comments, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the assembly itself, we don't have the expertise to be auditors for this project or probably any other. Um, and we already have an audit committee in, in place, and that might be a really good avenue um, to, to, uh, to have the oversight. And hiring outside expertise is a really, really good idea. I mean, all the money this port expansion has cost us, all the headaches that we've been through, and what we're going through right now, it just makes sense that, you know, we, that funding be provided so that we can have some real true um, assembly oversight. The audit committee is three um, members of the administration and three members of the assembly. So it's really like a joint thing. But, and I'm just throwing that out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bacalus. Uh, so uh, a while back, you know, that same question came up, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, at least item one, not item two. Uh, and what we had committed to that we would uh, brief the Enterprise Committee or the, or the Assembly as a whole, a body as a whole, uh, on an update. And I think at that time I'd stated that we would do it on a monthly basis. I think I also stated that, I didn't state it, but what I was thinking at the time is that we would come up with elements of the briefing that's acceptable to the assembly. So in other words, I would propose the elements to be briefed, and if that's the format that you like and those are the areas that you want to be briefed on, then that's what we will brief on when we give you uh, the update, whether they're monthly, quarterly, whatever you know you feel is the appropriate uh, frequency. So that is not a surprise to me. That is not anything that I think and, and we've it, talked it about wasn't gut-wrenching for me no. or anything else because I think that that's a prudent way of dealing with it. As far as the audit, I, I have no comment on that. Uh, Ms. Dembowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure I was in the queue, but I always have something to say. So you raised that, your, well, <laughs> either that or you scratched your chin. <laughs> Um, you, you may not be able to answer this, so I'll ask it if you say you can't, you can't. But um, the proposed contract is about a potential of $30 million. And I know you had stated that CH2 was a low bidder. If we deny this, it goes back out for RFP without talking sure. specifically about the other bidders. What can we anticipate another bid would come back at price-wise? Any ideas? Through the chair, Mr. Mouse. First of all, maybe we place semantics. Maybe we place semantics, but it's not a bid, it's an RFP. So I don't mean to be disrespectful. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't. I was going to say the purchasing world is not my forte, but I do appreciate well, would We would have to go out with another RFP, which would be a delay of minimum three, probably more likely six months, which just pushes the project on down and cost will undoubtedly go up. Who knows whether it will be. Uh, if we change the term of the contract to address Mr. Starr's concern, that it's extremely likely that I will have to cancel the entire RFP and start it all over because that is a material change to it and <coughs> it would uh, potentially... Uh, Which part of it are you talking about, Mike? Chief? Changing the term from five years to three years. Because that's a material change but to what Tabowski was saying, if you just issue a new RFP, it wouldn't be that we would take the new, we would just cancel this RFP and rewrite a new one based on terms we predicate. It would be what we've done here before. I guess, I guess my, my comment, what I was going to, I, didn't, I was trying to be creative and not mm -hmm. ask it, but I was wanting to know, you know where we are today. If, if this is obviously the low bidder. I have no idea how much the second bidder was. I'm trying to quantify in my mind what our potential outcome could be if CH2 Hotel is excluded. So through the chair, Mr. Bosky, CH Temple would be excluded from proposing again. I'm saying in front of a political body that obviously has a problem with the fact that they bought VECO, which we have current litigation. So I'm saying I recognize the political reality of the situation. That's why I said I probably will be told by legal I can't ask this question. But I want to know if the political body keeps saying no to CH2M Hill, the second bidder, I want to know how much is it? Is it 40 million? Is it 35 million? Is it, we're at 30 million now. I'm not able to answer that yeah. question. That's what I expected time. you would say, but that's where I'm trying right. to go. Right, and, and as the purchase officer was indicating, what would happen is if you went back out and had a new round of proposals, 
a general proposition because time is money. The cost might go up, but we don't know that for certain, and we don't know what those cost differences might look like. We don't know whether you'd have more bidders or fewer bidders than you have already. We just don't know. Mr. McCaleb, and, and to, um, to Ms. Dombrowski's uh, question, I, I just want to remind everyone that if we went out on a a, 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 re a, re a request for proposals started all over again. You know, we've added quite a few months to the process. But maybe that's not material to some, and maybe it is, I don't know. But I think what I need to highlight is a comment that the purchasing officer made early on when he was making his remarks. And that was that the only proposal that's been compromised and I say compromised because what we did is, as our rules outline, that once we have determined who the successful proposer is, and we have basically served notice to that effect, then that document, only that document, no one else's, becomes visible and available to all other competitors that were in that process. So everyone else that competed has had the opportunity or has already looked at that proposal, okay, which CH2M Hill prepared uh, in good faith. So I just bring that to your attention that uh, that's just, you know, I guess that's the way it is, but that's the way it is. I, I want to get this wrapped up here shortly. Ms. Johnson, I've got you, Mr. Sarr, we've got another topic that we've got to cover within this two hours. Ms. Johnson? Um. I understand that there's somebody from CH2M Hill that is sitting in the back, and I'd like to ask him up to the table and have him introduce himself. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Laswell. Uh, I'm the Senior Vice President with CH2M Hill. I've been involved in this um, process relative to the court since we took on the suitability study with the core and been actively involved in the pursuit I've been in various sessions. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, first of all, you will not be the project manager, is that correct? I will not be the project manager. And could you tell us just briefly about the project manager? Um, our project manager uh, is one of the select few we have, uh, probably in the world, who's actually managing a project identical to this as we speak today. He is currently our project manager on the Gulfport, Mississippi project. It's $570 million, and it's both a restoration because of, of the hurricane and, a, and an expansion. Um, along with that project manager, we are also bringing with him his head of, of uh, program services and engineering. So we committed to the port, which I think is part of the reasons we were selected, two very unique, very capable people that we plan to move to Anchorage, Alaska, to take on this very important assignment to the port. This is a 30-year experience in the division. Not just a great manager, a great manager of port expansions and restoration projects. Okay, my, my next question is, does this project manager, have, have, have they had the experience where a project has been, instead of being expanded, has been contracted? The individual, I think, has got a variety of the 30 years of experience in a variety of different kind of port projects. I can't speak specifically to your question exactly where there's been all expansion or contraction, but every one of them has those kind of dynamics and exactly how you're going to expand it. You've had the conversation today, how are you going to expand it, the most optimum way to do that, et cetera. He's had experience in those kinds of projects. And, and he's had experience in this maybe not the exact same environmental situations as we have in the Port of Anchorage, but in challenging situations? Um, yes. I mean, every port project has its own sort of unique environmental requirements and, and conditions. And he's very familiar with those. But that's one of the prime reasons we chose to team with HDR, because they are one of the, the, the premier sort of environmental firms in Alaska. They've done a great deal of environmental for me, and they're probably the leader in the beluga whale related issues, which are also very integral to this port expansion project. So where we didn't think maybe we had all the expertise that we wanted, we brought somebody else in to fully complement our team, and that's why one of the key roles they play on the team. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stark? 
Well, Ms. Timbowski made the statement that it was down to whether or not we thought Sage Tumor was qualified or not. And I spent about 25 minutes or so figuring out how the lawsuit played into that. And really, no, no, that's not it really for me. It's are we prepared as, as a body here in the city to, to sort of go into that five year arrangement and hold up our side of the bargain equally as much? And so, you know, th that comment, um, as you've sat in the back, was, was that ideally I wouldn't want to restrict anybody from BECO that was very talented, whether they were here or not. Um, you know, I'd maybe like to talk to the guy that put the big rocks out there, whoever that guy was, you know, but the guy that's driving the dump truck that worked for VECO, I don't need him on the list, you know, much less how would we know what skill we want to exclude on that list. It's not your problem necessarily, but I hope you take away the messages. You know, my reservations are still, are we, are we ready to, to move forward? To me, bluntly, I don't see any difference between the, you know, the MIRAD relationship that we had and the CH Doom Hill. I, our organizational structure is still the same. We're not going to be available to audit quality of work. There's no gates, there's no benchmarks, there's no uh, understanding. We, we, in my opinion, need to get better at that first uh, and then have a, have a way to get out if it's not looking good for either of us. That's what I hope you take away. It's not a slamming at CH Doom Hill. I think when Mr. Steele said, right, your reputation carries it, I went to the Air Force Academy and watched what you do down there from a management company. Wonderful if we can outsource, but that, that, that takeaway is, is something yeah. that I would want to consider. Can, can I respond? If you'd like, sure. I mean, all, all the conversations you have are all the right kinds of conversations. I mean, you've got a major and very important piece of infrastructure that, that you have responsible charge of, and it's really important that you advance it. Um, I just want to put on the table to be clearly there is one individual, former VECO employee that had any connection to the work that VECO did that was still employed by CH Twin Hill, we are 100% willing to include in any contractual relationship, either embedded in the agreement or in a side agreement, that that individual will not be included. We're more than 100%. I do want to highlight that we, I, we tried to be very transparent in this process because when we did our work with the Corps, we fully exposed to them all the work we did and who did it. There was an assertion during that work that maybe we violated that agreement, and, they, and the Corps of Engineers audited us and found that we had complied 100%. Nobody worked on it. The one individual worked on this, and we're prepared to make that commitment. I, I do just want to respond. Well, maybe. let me ask you, I mean, well, and I'll not to debate you, Dennis LeBlanc should not be calling assembly members in, in, in the fact that he represents VCO. You know, I'm not going to say he's the guy, but come on, he knows better than that. You don't call assembly members encouraging the selection of VCO. We're in litigation. Uh, in so hindsight, I was uncomfortable with me. That, that, was, that. that was a mistake. And, and he, uh, he pushed, yeah. me at least. So we're trying to get to the point where we'd written that letter to give you some more information and perspectives to see if you had any questions. That was not the appropriate approach. This is right here is, is yeah. public yeah. and formal. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, um, I'm happy I, to have it. We the chair wants to move on, I guess. So it's not all. Can I just things. respond quickly to your mayor and comment? I think one of the things your 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 team has done is to acknowledge what's really required to advance a port project of this size and complexity and taken a much different approach than I think Marat or others may have taken. You've actually put a very high stock in getting the people who know how to manage projects to know how to manage port projects and actually have an intimate knowledge of the current port and situations as your team. And I think some of those attributes may have been missing in, in the former activity. But I think the, the staff has done a very good job making clear what it is you need and evaluating whether who's the best to provide it to you. We're the legislative branch though, so <laughs> Ms. Johnson says we don't have that set up yet. I don't know the gates, the benchmarks, the, what we want from, the, from that. So if we can get there, absolutely. I think it's a good idea, but we, you may have that confidence on the other side, but you know, we've, we've been read, you know, down that path before and told all as well. Any other questions? Ms. Bray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, CH2M Hill is a great organization and quite capable, but I just realized that both Mr. Train and I may have a conflict because CH2M Hill is a partner with National League of Cities, and I serve on the board of directors, and Mr. Train is on the advisory board, so I just wanted to make that statement. This is an assembly meeting. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Trombley. Real quick, from your knowledge, has CHML ever been in the situation that you are right now, where you're currently in litigation with with somebody who you're now doing, okay. we're possibly going to be doing work for? Okay. 
Is yeah. this, is, this is a, I mean, we have, maybe not common, but that's, it's, it's not common. It does make your head scratch. I'll acknowledge that. It, uh, we're a, a large company do work with a lot of public and private companies. Uh, BP, for example, is one of our largest clients, and we have disputes with BP going on today, and we continue to work with, with, with BP. Uh, so while it's not common, it, it, it does occur. So you've been in a situation where you've done work in the past, or you've acquired companies that's done work in the past, you're in litigation with them, and you're awarded a brand new contract Correct. for that same exact type of work. Correct. Okay. I have no one else in the queue, and, and Mr. Starr, I really, if, if there's important questions I, I, I want to address, and we may need to extend the meeting, but if we've covered everything, I'd like to move on to ML. Well, I'm, I'm not sure how the committee versus the formal meeting works here. I'm a little it, it's confused. a formal meeting. So, so we can extend it like a formal meeting. Well, we don't vote, though. It's an assembly meeting. This is an assembly meeting. Yeah, we can oh. vote. The the attorney, <laughs> my my attorney is just handed to me that I do acknowledge your uh, disclosure, but uh, you have really no financial or private interest in this. So uh, you my, talking to me, Mr. Chairman? Pardon? He's talking yeah, to both of you. Know, oh, both okay. of you. Okay. That you do not have a substantial financial or private interest in that company, and that, that you there. would participate. May I say, Mr. Chairman, that I really appreciate that, but yes. you know. I thought it was important to mention. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Julia. Okay. With that, I'm going to move to item 4B, which is the municipal light and power financials. And I am actually going to hand the gavel to Ms. Johnston to handle this portion. The uh, clerk has asked if we can have a five-minute break while everybody's shifting, and uh, also I go and get the story.
don't play with the very simple. I'm surprised you've ever seen Dick Paul Orman, George and Mr. Bowski is just outside the door, and Mr. Hall is just outside the door. George Michaelis. Uh, Mahoney. Rick Miller. Okay. Who will be presenting? Me. I'll start. Okay. Oh, and Mr. Birch is with us by phone. And Nerdy Hall. Thank you. I'll start. I can use my new guy card one, so I have that used here, and uh, just say hi. Um, it's part of those other duties as assigned. So far, I'm kind of enjoying it. Um, I just want to say there's a really great group of deep, hardworking people down there at ML and Team. Um, we have nothing but good things to say about them. Good group. Um, working hard, uh, doing things to the right. There's a, a lot of peripheral issues going on. I've just been going from meeting to meeting. Uh, I just came from the DEMC meeting, which is the Bradley Project Management Committee, and dealing with issues with homeowner electric practices. Just giving you the highlights here, but Lucinda and Rick will kind of present the financial, so I'll let it go from there. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Johnson, do we have till 1 o'clock? Well, we'll yes, till 1, and if we need more time, we can extend. Okay. I could till, yeah, to not that can go really fast or slow? Um, I'll, I'll go fast. And do, you want, and do you want people to interrupt you or questions afterwards? Um, to me, it's more collaborative, because okay. the other question is just asking. Okay. So what, what we what we plan to do today, and, and recommend the work on this point, is to go through our preliminary year-end 2013 actuals in regard to finance, um, with a focus mostly on cash flow, because it's my understanding that that was the objective of this conversation. And then, of course, as you know, cash flow impacts our ability to make our dividend payment as well as fund our capital programs. So we'll talk a little bit about that briefly, just go over a little bit about the dividend, and then share with you um, what we plan to do in terms of fine-tuning our cash management uh, going forward. So with that, if we could go to uh, the, the first page inside of the document, what you will see is our, uh, our revenue and expense statement with 2012 and then 13 as a comparison to budget and the delta. And um, I will at this point just go through the highlights uh, because I know you've had several briefings over the past six months uh, about an l &P. But based on where we are at today, we believe our total revenues uh, to be down uh, from budget uh, $21 million. And this is largely due to the fact that we anticipate 
anticipated the full rate increase associated with SPP to be in effect for the full year, but it was not. So as a result, that drove um, a lower revenue. And additionally, as we've discussed in the past, our sales for resale number is significantly lower. And this is largely due to the fact that Golden Valley is making its power purchases from Chugach rather than from MLP. Now we understand that that contract, um, that purchase contract will expire in August of this year, so there may be an opportunity for us to pick back up those sales. Okay, uh, Mr. Traney first. Lucinda, uh, yeah, I see military here, it's down 1,700,000, what happened? Is it just military using less power? It's down compared to budget because we anticipated higher revenues due to a higher rate. Okay. Okay, so it's really, it's, it's, it's largely about the rate. Okay. The uh, landfill to a trash to gas project to Fort Rich has reduced sales to Fort Rich. But that was Yes, okay. Okay, so that was That's right. Okay, that, if you Sorry. compare 13 to 12, you might see that. Mm -hmm. 2013, and we discussed this when we did the budget, we anticipated revenues to be about 1.8 million less due to the equipment of the going on sales at our trash yes. So, um, Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, you mentioned that Golden Valley is purchasing power from Chugat instead of MLP because it's cheaper. Actually, not. That's okay. Then, my next follow up question is why? why? I guess we're building. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We, we believe that they basically got into a take or pay gas contract that you guys provided, it would provide the gas to Chugach Electric. And basically, if they don't buy the power from Chugach, they're paying for it anyway. But our price, we've dropped our price quite a bit. As, as you remember, when we did the uh, presentation to you on the on the uh, budget presentation, I had a slide on sales for resale. And our price averaged in last, in 2012, was $104 per megawatt hour. We dropped it down to $63 per megawatt hour. We're still not making hardly any sales. When that, uh, natural gas contract expires in August, hopefully we can make the wood sales. The sales really benefit our customers. We don't get to keep the margins. They get returns to our customers through the COPA. Last, in 2012, on $16.4 million of sales, we got to keep less than $400,000 as, as basically O and M cost. We recovered the cost of the fuel, but the margins, the profits over $7 million went back to the customer. We're in negotiations to start selling again in September. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so I'm looking at um, total expenses. Can I, I didn't know your past revenues. Can I ask you a question? One of these items, I believe, was the one that triggered me. I picked this actually up off of your, one of your quarterly summary reports with the interest um, earnings in the, in the general cash pool. Where, where is the interest generated? Is that the cash on hand specific to, to the allocated cash on hand that they generate to the cash pool? It would be in the miscellaneous non-operating revenue line item. Yep. And you can see it's down 239000 compared to budget, but down... Uh, what about the line above it, Lucinda, where it says they, they're, they're contributed, they get interest from the general cash pool as well? Yes, I mean, that's lower because, first of all, we have less money in the cash pool of the commercial paper program and that in combination with lower right. interest rates, yes. And that, that, that was the, ba the general start of my concern, and I, I'll not be told that I know exactly what I'm talking about in there, but that's where it started for me was seeing that and then specifically this enterprise having sort of a historic low. You, you indicated in the earlier slide that it's 10 million sort of number, and I think I saw it even lower than that. You did, and we're going to there are different points in the year yes. where your cash balances are going to fluctuate based on working capital needs yes. as well as your capital expenditures. And so we'll talk a little bit about Okay, that. if you're going to do it later on, then I'll wait. But yeah. my big concern is, 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 in fact, that working capital. And then if, right. if we had a you know, wind, a wind storm or we had a major something, yeah. we wouldn't do it. Yeah. 
So and we're, we're going to go into that pretty deep. And what I'm doing here sure. first is providing a framework to I got understand it. the cash so that we can then talk about the cash. Okay. And then okay. while you're talking about expenses, also the forward looking slide talks about where you might have used capital monies for operating expenses. Is that reflected in here or is that something else that you're going to tell us? Um, that would not be here because these have been adjusted I see. to make those corrections. Um, but we will talk about the cash balances this on the slide, and we do differentiate between operating capital and restricted. Operating capital, capital and restricted, the three different buckets of cash. Yeah. In your one-year slides, you referenced the fact that mm -hmm. capital monies were used for operating expenses, and that's what I'm zeroing in on. Um, did, did in fact that occur? It happened at Solid Waste Services some time back, and I wanted. Yes, to that did occur. And that was one of the reasons why those um, earlier numbers uh, that I had seen in regard to cash balances were negative. Sure, show those. And so those, um, based on reviewing those I numbers, MLP made corrections, and they moved those monies in the correct buckets. Can I expand just a minute on that? Because then I'll be done. So when you did that adjustment, did did in fact you move commercial paper money over to that then to, to take the capital monies no. and move it into operational to zero out that number? No, commercial Where did the money come from to slide it over and correct that imbalance? Okay. First of all, commercial paper can only be used for capital projects. Sure. And that is its sole purpose. It cannot be used for operating. If it did, you know, I could go to jail. Can you back I'm up the one here that could go to jail. So that's not happening. And let me ask you, you just confirmed that there was a situation where we used capital money for operating expenses, correct? No, we used operating to fund capital. And that was why the operating cash balance was so low and negative. Yes. And so we had made corrections to fix that. Okay, describe okay. that then. Pardon me? What were the corrections? Um, there was a $3.5 million capital purchase was made out of the operating funds that should have been made out of the capital funds. Mm -hmm. And so that transfer, you know, it was reviewed, recognized as an error, and a transfer was made to, to put it in the proper bucket. Actually, we fund capital projects out of operations at times, and you'll see that further back. And initially we had, it's a rebuild of sub-16 number by ACS, about a $3.5 million project. We looked at, at moving that though and be getting reimbursed from commercial paper to help out with the operating cash situation because it looked like it was going to be tight at the end of the year. There's the principle I'm concerned about losing money. There's nothing <coughs> wrong with doing that. Yes, there is. It it's, is you're it's a capital project, Bill, and it's being funded by commercial paper. It's not an operating project. It's, it's a capital. It's capitalized it's project, it's yeah. but it's funded from operating money or I'm sorry, operations. You didn't, I'm sorry, you didn't okay. say that. And maybe I said that wrong. We all heard it differently. Okay. okay. You, 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 you. I'm so sorry. Let me, let me give you some background. All right, please. Let and me I, give you some I'll get over it, Lucy. If you say all is well, I believe you. I know, but you need to understand. Ross Rizbold is our our guy sure. that manages capital projects and he manages commercial paper. We don't reimburse using commercial paper until we see the invoice. That Smart. means it was a capital project. Sure. And so we manage that very closely because it's subject to the IRS eyes. All right. And we're very, we manage that really closely. All right. And I'm trying to not be defensive here. I'll just raise my hand. This is what I do, guys. This is the checks and balance of government. I pick up something on an October, November report. I ask the question. It yeah. turns into a work session. So don't shoot the messenger here. Okay? Hey, I'm let trying me, to. Let me, let, me, let me say it just a little bit differently. Within the tariff, our rates, we're allowed to spend money on operating dollars on, and on capital dollars. As long as you don't draw, my only concern is this, is don't draw your operating capital down so far that if you have a windstorm or you have something you have to immediately order or you have to do over time, that we're, we, we don't have any cash. I agree. And that's all, I, I agree. mean, it's only observation was you were low. I don't even think you had a period and a half in, in the bank when I saw the number of payroll. It was low. Mr. Hahnemann? That's all. I'll leave it alone. Uh, I, I guess that's, Kind of along that same line on that that line, interest from general cash pool, and maybe you'll get into it later, so I can defer it if you need to. But you projected in 2000, uh, well, the actual in 2012 was 868. You projected nearly double that in 2013. The actuals came in way under, of course, that delta being nearly two million. So is that an anomaly, a one-off? What would? I mean, are we looking forward to this in the future? I mean, how's that? Work? It's as we had mentioned earlier, we have less money in the cash pool. And uh, 
the cash pool at the end of the year. But, but I thought you said you corrected that. This is over a period of time. Okay, this represents January through December. Right. Okay, so you had some time, some time in the month, or some time in the year. So, for example, in February, we might have a lot of money in the cash pool. Right. Then in March, we may not. We have three pay periods. Then we may issue commercial paper. And, I mean, it's just a constant fluctuation. So what this represents is the addition of January through December for all of that. Okay, and so at the end of the year, which is in December, it reflects a singular point in time, which is what the next slide represents. Okay, okay. Um, I'll follow through. I may have some further questions. But... <coughs> no, but where, where I want to go okay. with this, proceed. Like everybody seems to calm their hands. Okay, where I want to go with this is I want you to understand that on a bottom line basis, if you look at the very bottom number. Um, this number represents the cash flow that MLMP generates. Okay, this is a really important number because this is what feeds the organization. So in 2012, it generated $32.5 million. And that money is then used to fund the 2013 dividend, okay, because we have to wait until the, the financial statements are audited. And it funds the debt payments and it also funds our capital expenditures. So then when you look at 2013, our estimate here for what do we think uh, the organization generates in cash, it's 28 million. So throughout the year, cumulatively, it generates $28 million. Now at the end of the year, on December 31st, that is a single day, a single point in time, and that is what is recorded in our year-end financial statements. And that number isn't going to be or represent something like 28 because it's a function of where your working capital is on that day, that singular day. Okay. So when we have uh, 32 million, uh, what we had planned, and I'm going to just jump ahead to go to a couple of slides in where it has the dividend payment there. So we generated in 2012 $33 million okay, in cash. So the plan was then that $15 million of that would be used to fund the capital program, plant two primarily. Um, $21 million of it is then used to pay our debt service associated with our bonds. And then six million was payable for the municipal dividend. And that was approved at the point in time that we did our budget. So this um, is an example in that this is a healthy organization that is generating good cash to support its capital and its dividend program. <coughs> However, it was lower in 2013, okay? And so there was concern, and Bill raised a really good question, there was concern about it being lower because if you look at the numbers, it was lower by $7 million. And the reason, as we talked about, is largely because of the not getting the rate increase at the beginning of the year. That was the primary reason for that. And additionally, because if we didn't get the rate increase, plus we had to fund SPP. So we had to fund SPP for a total of $3 million in combination with not having the rate increase to support it. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Lucinda, what was the estimated revenue from the rate increase? What would it have been that we didn't get? 18 million would have been the full year rate increase. Okay. Great. And so when you think about 2014, you know, the rate increase is in effect. So for 14, we'll have 18 million more in revenues and then we will be financially strong again relative to comparing to 12. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move to extend 15 minutes to 2.15. Second. Any problem with that? Um, I have one question. We saw some of this happening as it was happening. What was going on at MLNP as far as just managing their expenses at the time? Or was there any opportunity to manage expenses knowing that your revenues were dropping? 
I started informing the general manager and actually our commission probably uh, last summer. So I was concerned about cash and the way it was going. And we did, we did, uh, when we did the, the budget, the 2014 budget, we cut probably 40 to 50 million dollars out of the capital budget. Now, of course, that was going forward. But we did look at, and if, if you look at the expenses, we came in pretty much in every category versus the budget. Laborers came in under two and a half million dollars under the budget. Quite a few of the other items are under the budget. So we did start trying to cut back. Please go. Oh, Mr. Hahnemann. So the bottom line is, as I'm hearing, is that the general, the dividend that we were projecting isn't there. Um, it was there, because if you look at 2012 actuals, you can see. No, I'm, I'm talking about for 2013. Is that well, for 2013, it's there also. Mm -hmm. And we have adequate cash to pay it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to show you on the next slide. Okay. okay? So what this next slide represents are our cash balances. Now remember, this is a point in time, and these balances also are cumulative. So they don't represent just the prior year's activity. They represent activity from years and years and years ago. This is not for Oh, just a three-year summary? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just cash balances. Yeah. So what, what I want you to, to see here is in 2011, in regard to total cash balances, um, the total was $155 million. In 2012, it dropped to $146 million. And in 2013, it's back up at the end of this year to $155 million. And what we were looking at, um, particularly in regard to the capital number, as we approached year end, was that could have potentially been a negative number had we not issued some commercial paper in December to reimburse ourselves <coughs> for expenses that had already been incurred. So we did issue 17 million of commercial paper in the middle of December because we had incurred 17 million in expenses. So that got us to a positive balance. Otherwise, this number would have been negative. But that is a standard part of our financing plan to do this. Our year-end reports have a lot of scrutiny. Um, RCA looks at them. Our rating agents look at them. And it was prudent for us to, to reimburse ourselves for those expenditures so that we would show positive balances. This probably. Just going back to the, to the dividend just got me thinking. Under the under the bottom, the policy change was made in 2012. Am I correct on that? No. Or that's no, the recommendation. Okay. Yeah, this is what we're going to do going forward. Right. To prevent okay. So. Problem. Okay. So that goes back to since since the numbers were low, and and MLP pays a dividend, that the dividend that they paid isn't in jeopardy or um, based on our numbers being low. So, so that's not going to affect anything. First quarter budget revisions that we've heard from the fire department. I don't want to compound. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Okay. All right. Yes, Thank you. Sir. So just to be clear, you, you reimbursed yourself for capital outlay, mm -hmm. for capital expenses. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you would like to go into the finance office and review the No, it's just you said 17, yeah. and then on the next slide, the next page, it says capital operations um, were funded by operations for $15 million. So Okay, that's two different things. I see. Okay, commercial paper issued and capital expenditures funded mm -hmm. are different. And you fund the, this, this, on the second page, you fund that just pure out of cash out of checkbook, out of cash on hand. I don't understand. Your, your cash on hand covers this, this right. other yeah. page. Right, yeah. The $33 million that yeah. was generated by operations sure. was used to fund capital by $15 million. But remember, the organization does not generate enough to fund a $300 million project. So that's why we go into debt and we issue commercial I, I, And I, I get okay. that part. Okay. Can I ask one question the about the $5 million change order that kind of hit us all by surprise? Where did that fund from? I don't know Commercial paper. paper. Okay. So, so back to uh, the cash balances slide. I mean, this is, this is what... Uh, Rick is forecasting for uh, hit the year end 2013, and um, it's it's right aligned with where we were for uh, 2011. Um, the largest number on here, of course, is our restricted cash 
and this is largely uh, related to the money that's restricted for the Beluga River uh, gas unit. The RCA restricted that money so that it can only be used for capital expenditures, and so that's what it's used for. There are other restrictions in that money, but, but that is money that um, we cannot use to fund capital or to fund um, operations. So moving on, um, I think we talked about uh, the, the dividend slide, uh, but, I, but I want to talk about the last bullet, and, and that is uh, what we've done to to try to improve this process going forward. Um, what we're going to do is submit some code changes that would um, require MLMP as well as our other utilities to make their distributions to the general government by specified dates. And then that way they can better manage um, their cash and there won't be all this concern about their inability to make a dividend payment because um, it will have been known and managed up front and in advance. The, the concern that I have is your ability to do just that. If you've got, you're getting tight on your commercial paper account is what I see. It, it's 75 million, you got 55 million forecast for this year. How, how does that work into the equation? You pay down a certain amount of commercial paper, frees up capacity? No, we have a $185 million line of credit. For sure. Commercial and you have $75 million left? Uh, yes, we have $75 million left. And um, what we will be doing is, as we spend that, probably in the middle part of this year, mm -hmm. we'll be evaluating how much have we spent to date, and do we increase our, our line of credit on our commercial paper program, or is it time to issue a revenue bond? Okay, and then convert it into a 30-year note, 30-year mm -hmm. bond. How many bonds do we have outstanding now for our infrastructure? For MLMP, um, many. I don't have. I mean, is it a lot it's, of money? I guess would be the number. It equates to a 30 million dollar uh, debt payment. Because there was a problem in the past where we had trouble getting commercial paper for the port, and I, I guess I don't want to get into that problem here with MLMP that our debt to equity ratio or our cash position or our overall. So, I mean, that's my end game here, Lucinda, is to make sure we've got a, a healthy ability to do just what you said and yep. not find out in June that, oops, nope. you know. Go to the very in. last slide. Um, if you go to um, the very last slide, which is uh, the one inch plan. So, um, not the question slide, <laughs> but the slide before the question slide. <laughs> so, um, what we've done is this we, we've based on you know just all the conversation that's occurred about this over the last few months is, is, is I'm going to ask MLP to update their full comprehensive plan uh, and have them do modeling uh, financial modeling that requires them to meet certain financial targets which is a 60 to 40 debt to equity um, to have over a hundred days of cash outstanding and to have debt service coverage of 1.5 and these metrics, if they are met, will cause the organization to go all the way back into both looking at its operating costs, its revenues, and its capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. Because they all come together with these three measures. Will you have that by June, do you think, Lucinda? That could be hard. We'll work on it more this summer. I've had a vacancy of five people in the staff of 22. I'm finally getting a controller starting on Monday. But we've, we've got the uh, year in close coming up. We've got auditors coming in a few weeks. I've got to get the audited financials out. It's a pretty big production now with all the GASBY pronouncements. We, we've already started working on it. We've actually started looking at the outstanding open work orders to see, capital work orders, to see, okay, can we, you know, we really need to do this? Can we defer it, delay it? So we started the process, but to have the whole plan done by, June could be a little tough. I'm, I'm more worried about getting these audit financials out the door by June 30. Um, in uh, yes, I just don't want to wake up June 30 and you're, you're extended your cash available lines of credit. We got a $200 million plan under construction and we don't have any money. The, the rate increase to the additional $18 million a year will definitely help. And we appreciate that you guys approved that back last fall. So if we roll forward to the year in 2014, assuming that the budget assumptions are met, 2014 will generate um, just under $38 million in cash. Or on the record, 
Pardon me? For on the record. I know, but that, I mean, that's, that's what... Around. That's what around, just yeah, yeah, around uh, 38 million, and that's assuming we meet the budget numbers. But, I mean, that's, that's a healthy amount of cash. Mr. Kendall, I'm looking at you. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Gray Jackson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, but I, I had an interest question, but it's been answered in this slide, so thank you. Everybody else fine? Good. Uh, Mr. Seale. Yeah, yeah, my, my question was, did I did I understand it correctly? You're saying that you're going to ask MLMP to pay uh, the municipal dividend quarterly? No, what we're going to do is, upon completion of the audited financial statements, mm -hmm. which would verify revenues, because the dividend is based on revenues, we're going to ask them to make it twice, uh, make it in two increments. One in August, I think is what I said, and then October. Yeah. yeah. So that, that gives the municipality the interest growth on it rather than uh, enterprise? Yeah, that full 0.1%. Uh -huh. But yeah. <laughs> And what it does is it better it, it better enables MLMP to manage their cash. Otherwise, it's all one big Otherwise lump. Otherwise, in the end, there isn't anything payment. left. Uh, Mr. Hahnemann? I guess that's my question. What's the what's the obligation for the dividend? I mean, if they are in fiscal straight, let's just say because of not knowing whether the contract, you know, maybe you expected a sale of $10 million worth of gas or power, and it didn't come through. And at the end of the year, how, how, how does that mean? Is the dividend six million? It's because it was budgeted, and they have to do it, or is it six million because it's contractual? It's in, in code. I mean, what? what it's it's the, the municipal code indicates that the dividend is five percent of revenues. However, if there would be a situation where MLMP would be so would be cash constrained such that it would cripple their organization, we would probably come to the assembly with an amendment that would amend that dividend because we would not want to do that. Yeah. And the sale of natural gas does it go in the income statement at all since 2007? It goes into that one restricted investment to be used only for future VRU construction or future natural gas purchases. So it's to sell so, power, not, not the gas. Right. Yeah. But I think you said power and gas. I did. I said yes. So that said, who's managing the short-term gas purchase contracts now at Mr. Posey's cost? We have a group of people. Uh, PRA is still on contract. Are you sitting in memo here? Yeah. They like us? So far. And the only reason we sell the gas is to get the tax credits from the state of Alaska. Last year was $10 million tax credit we got for the construction at the BRU. Any other questions? I, I will say that a similar process, slightly similar process, was we did, or the administration did with AWWU as far as modeling and as far as setting up budgeting parameters. And I think all of you have seen the benefits of that approach. And, and Trust that it will have the same benefits. I guess we're adjourned. Thank you.